Okay, so in the previous video, uh, we introduced the concept of a uh, random variable, uh, which is the name given to this function which maps uh, any old random probability space onto a standard probability space that uh, has elements just in the real numbers. So the outcomes of this standard probability space are, are just numbers in this case. And the, the reason we want to do that, why, why did we make them numbers? Well, because uh, maths is all about numbers. Maths has a lot of other structures defined on uh, real numbers. So there is, for instance, there's algebra and calculus defined on real numbers. So that is why we are mapping these abstract probability spaces onto these standard probability spaces and instead we will study the standard probability space and the whole idea was that as far as the probability space structure goes the two probability spaces the standard one which has um, outcomes just elements of the real numbers and the um, the abstract random one um, which could be anything, it could be the outcomes of any experiment, but as far as the probability space structure is concerned, they are the same in some way. Well, they're not necessarily the same, but uh, the standard one is somehow an a... Um, it's... Um, its structure is within the abstract probability space. Um, in some cases, you can have that they are exactly in correspondence, and that's similar uh, to the concept of an isomorphism in algebra. So we could describe it as a probability space isomorphism, and in other cases, they're not in bijection in that way. Uh, so uh, that's more similar to a homomorphism from an algebra. Okay, uh, so in this uh, in this um, video, we're going to uh, expand on the concept of a random variable, specifically discrete random variables. So a discrete random variable is a random var uh, so a discrete random variable discrete random variable uh, is a is a function, well it's a function from an arbitrary probability space, so from an abstract probability space to a standard probability space such that the standard probability space that you are mapping it onto has uh, either finite number of points in it, i.e. Uh, so if we draw this other, uh, this standard probability space that we are mapping it on, so here is our function, our discrete random variable, um, which is mapping our, our abstract probability space over here onto our standard one, and our standard one has to have either finite number of numbers in, so for instance 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to n would be a finite probability space, um, standard probability space, or, or it could be countably infinite, i.e. it could be uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to uh, infinity, so it c c could be all of the natural numbers, or any set that can be bijected with the, um, random, uh, with the natural numbers. So that's the definition of a discrete random variable. And when we have uh, this case, when we have uh, a probability space, our abstract probability space, which can be bijected like this with something uh, with a probability space of this form, uh, then in that case, all of the um, all of the outcomes in this standard probability space can be put uh, in sets on themselves. So you can have a set containing one, a set containing two, a, a set containing three, etc., uh, all the way up to uh, a set containing n, and they are all uh, events, so each one has an ascribable probability. Um, okay, um, so um, we can ascribe probabilities to each of those, so a probability of getting one, probability of getting two, in the way we've learned to do. So this is just a standard probability space, and this function now that maps each one of these numbers, because you can view these... Um, in the um, language of abstract probability spaces, what we are really doing is the function probability is acting on a set of events, uh, a set which is an event, sorry, a set which is an event, uh, but these sets just contain a single element, so instead of viewing it as acting on the set of element, uh, the, uh, the set containing the element, we can just view it as acting on uh, one, two, all the way up to n, so we could plot this probability as a function, so we could have p of one here, uh, p of 2, etc. could be here, and then we could go up to p of n, uh, and basically when you do that, when you have this function which maps 0 to n onto uh, the probability uh, th of uh, the event uh, which is the uh, set containing just that single number uh, happening, uh, 
that it, that function is called a probability mass function. A probability mass function. Okay, uh, and the other concept that I want to address in this video, and I promised you in the last video, is the concept of what is a distribution. So basically, when you have these uh, standard probability spaces where, so when you have a probability space uh, where the outcomes are real numbers, so I'll just put an R there to show that the outcomes are real numbers, uh, then uh, the function, uh, then this, um, the probability space structure on here, i.e. Uh, you have a set of events, so let's call it F, and you then have a probability function mapping F onto uh, the interval 0 to 1, that, that structure is called a distribution. So when you have a uh, probability measure on, a, on the real line, it's known as a distribution, a probability distribution rather than uh, a probability measure. Uh, um, so that's what a distribution is. Um, so um, there are many ways to encode the information of a distribution. So the distribution is actually this function acting on this entire set of events. So uh, this set of events has a huge number of possible events in. So for instance, if we look at the uh, just the um, set from, uh, so we'll have 0, 1, 2, all the way up to n, that's a... Um, that's a discrete random variable. Um, well, it's a discrete um, probability space with elements in the real number numbers. And of course, we could have in our set of events, we could have all the units, uh, the unitary sets. So we could have zero, uh, one, um, all the way up to m, n. And additionally, we could have all sets containing uh, any two of these. So zero, one, um, <coughs> etc. Zero, two. So you'd go on. And then we could have the whole. We'd have to have the whole space. We'd have to have the empty set at some point by the axioms uh, that we've previously discussed. We'd have to have the whole space, and we could have, in fact, we could have every single set in the power set of this um, of this probability space. So it could actually be equal to the power set of our sample space. Okay. Um, so the probability distribution is this mapping that maps on each of these onto a real number between zero and one. The thing is. Do I actually need to tell you um, what uh, the probability function is for absolutely every single one of these sets? Of course not. If I tell you what it is for 0, what it is for 1, what it is for all of these sets that just contain a single element, I can work out what it is for all the others. This sets the answer to all the others uh, because um, any of the other sets is just a union, a disjoint union of these sets just containing a single element. Uh, therefore, if we want our probability, um, our probability distribution to satisfy the axioms of a probability measure, i.e., we want it to um, be countably additive, uh, then uh, the others, um, the uh, probability of an other and of a different set, say zero two has to be the probability of this one plus the probability of two. So let me just write some of that down. So if I take the probability of another set, let's say, um, containing zero and two, then that is equal to the probability of the set containing zero union the set containing two, and then uh, by the axioms of a probability measure, because I want it to be, it is a probability measure. Um, this is just the probability of the zero set uh, plus the probability that you get this um, 2. Uh, so the event where just 2 happens occurs. So now, uh, what happen, uh, that basically uh, determines, so if I tell you, if I tell you, tell you uh, what uh, p of 0, um, p, all the way up to p of what, uh, p of n rather, uh, are, then I determine the. Then you can work out the entire probability distribution. Then you can work out the entire probability distribution. So what this do, what does this mean? If um, this function, these these, what was what did I just previously call these? I called this function uh, which maps uh, each of these unitary sets onto uh, its probability. I called that the probability mass function. So the probability mass function uniquely determines a probability distribution. I e all the information of the probability distribution is encoded in the probability mass function. Um, so. Uh, 
if I have the set containing all possible probability mass functions, they are in correspondence, one-to-one -one correspondence with the set containing all prob possible probability distributions. Um, so that's uh, that's. So this is one way of representing the probability distribution. Just tell me the probability mass function. Now, when we get onto more complicated um, probability distributions, so when we get onto continuous ones where the uh, where you cannot you cannot build a probability mass function. So uh, this worked when we just had countably many elements, or finitely many. Of course, finitely many counts as countably many. Um, but when you have uncountably many elements, this is not going to be something that we can build. Um, so we're going to need different representations of the probability distribution. We're going to need different ways of representing the probability distribution. And another way of representing the probability distribution is something called a cumulative distribution function. And basically, the idea of the cumulative distribution function is that it's the sum of the probability mass function. So, for instance, if, our, if in this case, where we had uh, 0, uh, 1, uh, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to n, then the, P, the PMF, the PMF, the probability mass function was just going to do was just going to um, was going to map well I'll say it properly it maps uh, this um, this set of elements zero one all the way up to n so it maps all of these elements uh, all of these numbers onto um, onto well, it maps them onto zero one and specifically the way it maps them is if it if you want uh, what where it sends x it will send x to uh, the probability of the set uh, containing that single out that single number x, um, so that's uh, the PMF. The CDF, the cumulative distribution function, is defined as the sum of all of this. So the cumulative distribution function is going to send x uh, to um, to the sum uh, k is equal to zero to x of uh, the PMF of x. So um, PMF of x. I'll just put there PMF of x, which is obviously the probability of the singleton x. Okay, so what does that mean? So if I draw a picture here, let's say this is the PMF, the CDF will basically, for 0 it will remain the same, for 1 you will add the PMF of 1 to the PMF of 0, so the CDF will go up here, and I'll do it in a different colour. So um, we'll do it in blue, and we'll have crosses. So this is the CDF. So the CDF goes that. Oh dear, that's not that no good. So there's uh, the point of the CDF for one. The CDF for zero was the same as the PMF. Then we're going to add on two to here. So the next one along is going to go up there, and it's going to basically go on, and it's going to have to add up to one by the time it gets to n, uh, because the sum of the PMF must be equal to one, because if you sum up all of these probabilities, then that's the same as the probability of the union of all the singletons, which makes the whole space, which must have probability 1. Uh, so the CDF is going to go up to 1 by the time it's n, so it's going to be 1 up here. So that's another way of encoding all the information in the distribution. Why? Because from this, I can get the PMF back again. So basically, if I just say, what's the difference between the CDF at 0 and the CDF at 1? Well, uh, so if I take this CDF here at 1, and I subtract the CDF at 0, I'll get some difference there. And that must be what I added on, because when we went from 0 to 1, so that must be the PMF at one. So you can go backwards and forwards. From the PMF you can get the CDF, uh, from the CDF you can get the PMF, and therefore CDF is another another uh, way of representing uh, the uh, probability distribution. So all the information the probability distribution is encoded in the CDF, uh, and the CDF turns out to be a more powerful way of thinking about uh, encoding the uh, probability distribution, mainly uh, because... Oh, and I've made a terrible mistake here. I should not have... Uh, there shouldn't be a line through there. It should just be a series of points. The function isn't defined between 0 and 1. This is a discrete uh, discrete probability space. So ignore this being a continuous line. It should just... What I meant to emphasise from that is that it's going to go up to 1 by the time it gets to n, OK? Um, but the point is that the CDF um, is a way of representing all the information in a continuous, where the, in a continuous uh, probability space, i.e. Where, um, where the set of real numbers, the set of outcomes, is going to, um, going to be uncountable. Uh, and the CDF is a, still a valid way of representing it, whereas the PMF breaks down. 
Okay, so that's all I want to say in this video.